Okay, so we've had three papers now. Um, and just a very quick summation, I suppose, of some of the key points. Um, maybe that were made in all those papers rather than going through each of the papers individually um, by both Porek, Roland and Ian. Firstly, public awareness, civil society engagement with processes for challenging, um, challenging issues relating to economic and social rights. Whether these be soft mechanisms, individual complaint mechanisms, or collective complaints mechanisms, so the collective complaints mechanism, um, as outlined by Porik, individual complaints mechanism, um, as outlined by Ian, and then this new system, uh, which Roland gave in an excellent overview, overview of the universal periodic review process. <clears throat> so this question of both soft mechanisms, hard mechanisms for enforcement of um, economic and social rights um, within international regimes. And I suppose one key question, and, and I think Porik um, raised it and, and dealt with it quite effectively at, at the beginning of his presentation was, do we really need a debate on should we have constitutionalization of economic social rights, or are we happy with systems that will at least to some degree ensure um, a supervision or supervisory mechanism to ensure that states abide by their international obligations, whether those international obligations are under the European Social Charter revised, under the um, international human rights treaty mechanism, in particular the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and then this new system of peer review, uh, political peer review of um, states abiding by uh, general human rights obligations. So we've had quite a number of issues which have been dealt with in all three papers, and now we'd li I'd like to just open it up to the floor. I think Roisin has, has a mic, so do, we are being filmed, so please do um, do use the mic when asking question and first. Hi, um, Stephen O'Hare from the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Um, we don't believe in economic and social and cultural rights at all, so it's just all CCPR for us, right? <laughs> but just <laughs> don't send us your tired, your poor, or your huddle masses unless they're yearning to be. <coughs> Need access to a lawyer. Um, just on the, just wanted to make a comment really, and, and a question. Uh, it's great to have a discussion today about the complaints mechanism under the European Social Charter, and actually just to note that the ICCL is having an event in in early New Year with representatives from the European Social Charter coming to discuss the collective complaints mechanism, and it will be of particular interest to NGOs. And we hope to have somebody from an, an international NGO and a, a national NGO who have taken a case um, or taken a collective complaints proce uh, procedure. Um, and I, I think that will be interesting, more more details to follow, but just to flag that because we're talking about this morning. Um, question in relation to, to Roland, uh, to Roland really about the UPR mechanism. We've seen a first cycle of the UPR come around now. And so now we're beginning to see how implementation is taking place for member states that have already been examined and, and some who have been examined um, more than four years ago. Can you give an indication as to what sort of information is coming out now in relation to how well states are implementing their, their the, the commitments that they made? Is it, uh, was it cosmetic as many people feared? Um, and uh, the other thing about the mid-year review, uh, you, you mentioned Ireland had voluntarily signed up to the mid-year review to, to produce a report. Is this something that states are doing as a matter of course, or is it something that maybe only a few states are, are volunteering to do? And again, how effective are those mid-year reviews at highlighting implementation of, of, of recommendations? Thanks. Okay, thanks, Stephen. I think what we'll do is we will take a number of questions. Um, so do we have another question um, that we can put to the panel? Rory down here, Roisin, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for uh, that fascinating insight. And I just have a question for Porek, if I may. Um, when you finished off, you introduced the idea of using the European Union Charter uh, in order to make the right to housing in the ESC uh, more justiciable on an individual basis. And you mentioned the specific limitation that there has to be an EU dimension. Uh, could you 
give any idea as to how significant a limitation that is? Will it only be in very rare cases it will be possible to do that, or do you foresee something more expansive? Des, and then we'll um, come back to the panel after Des. Des? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, another question for Porik. Sorry, Porik. You, you you talked about the cases against Ireland in the uh, the RESC, the Revised European Social Charter, and the issues, housing, um, social assistance, et cetera, et cetera. In, by way of, um, you were, was there any work done in terms of whether there was more general application of those cases to those areas in terms of, was there were there general measures indicated by the committee? Um, was there any work done in terms of follow-up in terms of whether um, in, in it's, it's kind of state reporting, the state went back and addressed whether it was actually ensuring that you know the, the area that area had was being appropriately addressed. Okay, thanks for those questions. Okay, um, so maybe we will begin with the first question, Roland, which um, Stephen and ICCL asked, and any indication as to states abiding by the recommendations when the UPR process is it merely cosmetic? What is the purpose of the media review? Thank you, thank you for, for the question, Stephen. Um, looking into implementation is, as I said at the beginning, there's no independent mechanism doing it, so it's a bit of everyone having to look into what's happening, which is one of the weakness of, of the mechanism. Uh, we see that um, most, I mean, states that have been up for the second review, they've, uh, most of them have reported on uh, I mean, all of them have reported on recommendations they had received, and on most of them on 80% of recommendations. So when they came back for the second time, they had to produce a report, and in that report, they provided explanations on 80% of the recommendations they had received. So there's a fairly a good reporting on what's been done. It doesn't mean they're all implemented, but it means that states are um, aware of their importance of, their com of the obligation to report on implementation. Um, so, but now we, um, UPI Info, we always have this program that looks into implementation at midterm, which is only an indication. But what we've seen is um, looking into the practice of 66 countries um, concerning 3,000 recommendations. We've seen that at midterm, 40% of recommendations have triggered action. So, um, obviously, that ranges from all types of recommendations, from um, improving women's rights to um, abolishing death penalty, um, and so on and so on. We've had concrete cases of countries uh, accepting those kind of recommendations. China um, accepted to reduce um, the number of crimes punishable by death penalty. Um, so we have all sorts of, of, of implementation, but because it's on a high number, it obviously goes beyond cosmetic. Uh, it does pro produce some uh, uh, good concrete results on the, on the ground. Now in terms of midterm reporting, it's only a report. It doesn't get actually read by anyone. It's just sent by email to the United Nations. Then it's uploaded on the United Nations website. So um, countries, there's about 20, 25 countries that have done it so far, uh, which is um, a good number, but obviously far from being everyone. Um, but it doesn't get a lot of scrutiny, so that's why I may be raising, our, as an NGO coming to Geneva, uh, and trying not to challenge, but to give your perspective, but also creating a dialogue maybe at the national level after two years, it would be a good way to uh, to, to encourage uh, this reporting and to make sure that it's uh, discussed at some point because it will not necessarily be discussed at the United Nations because the countries just come and say, well, this is our report. You can download it from the UN website. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, Ronald. Um, and then the other two questions then for Porik. Um, maybe I'll take Des's first and then go to Ro uh, Rory's question. Des, uh, Des asked about general follow-up measures. Does it actually ensure compliance? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very good question because, um, again, it doesn't have the force of hard law. The Council of Europe doesn't have an army, so, you know, ultimately. Um, I can tell you that in two that I was involved in, the follow-up was one was France, where there was a, a finding of a breach of Article 31. And at the same time, France provided 500,000 units of social housing a year at the time, which was a remarkable finding in a way. And the finding was that although France did provide 500,000 units of social housing, 
which was commendable. The trend in terms of the numbers of people who are waiting for housing was actually increasing rather than decreasing. So that was the finding. That's how the finding was held. What France did after that was engaged uh, with um, a lot of NGOs, but actually introduced a law on housing rights, the DALO Act. It changed dramatically the funding for housing for travelers in Roma. So the groups in France were very quite, quite impressed with the result of that collective complaint. In Slovenia, which was a case where um, tenants who had been former state tenants uh, living in privatized accommodation were being evicted uh, because of prices rocketing after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Again, the government reluctantly, and it took, I think, three, four years, changed the law and, start, and gave protection to the tenants that they had, not quite as much as they had initially, but introduced ten protection measures. So the answer is, it doesn't actually work instantly, but quite like quite a lot of other things were mentioned today, the cumulative effect seems to be fairly powerful. Is that okay? And in relation then to Rory's question, I was going to say, European Union law. Yes, well, I was, um, I, was wondering, I was wondering who was going to ask the hard question, but <coughs> no better man to ask the hard question. Um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, of course, at the moment is in one of these uh, positions where there's not enough cases to make a definitive uh, statement. What we do know is that it can be used. Um, anywhere that the EU, any EU institution is acting, which of course I, I often say, well, that includes the European Central Bank, of course, which is an EU institution. Uh, can you show me their impact assessment on Article 34.3, the right to social and housing assistance, if you take into account the numbers of people being evicted in Spain and Greece? Uh, but nobody seems to have uh, followed up my suggestion there yet. The other, the other element is states when they are implementing EU law, as you know, is the definition. But that in itself is becoming a very, very loose and wide definition. And the terms within the scope of EU law is in included in the explanations to the Charter, which of course is much wider. And at the moment it's not quite clear how wide it goes, but we do know from the courts the Court of Justice of the European Union, that it has been, uh, the Charter has been really effective in some key areas. Uh, the notable cases, of course, were the farmers who complained that their payments under the Common Agricultural Policy were being put up on the website of the European Commission, and this was a breach of their privacy rights under Article 7 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So they went to court and got them to take it down, including the Irish farmers as well, actually benefited from that one, although I don't think they gave much credit to the Charter as such. There was also the insurance case, the Belgian insurance case, where different uh, insurance actuary decisions being made between men and women, which was found there was a regu was a, it was a directive, was found to be in breach of the charter, and that was struck down. Uh, there's been quite a lot of cases, but I haven't been able to find any that are directly related to the right of social and housing assistance. Um, it's something I'm researching at the moment with a number of people in, across Europe. But the, the, the essential point is that EU institutions are expected to do an impact assessment on all proposed measures to ensure that they comply with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, there has been something written about that, and it seems to be quite patchy, but it's something that could really be developed in line with lots of other work as well on budgeting and provision. So I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive answer, Rory, but that's as far as it is. And Ian... So I just, I just want to come back to, 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 to implementation. I remember about 10 years ago listening to a speech by Mary Robinson when she was still High Commissioner for Human Rights of the UN, and she said, we've got standards coming out of our ears, but what we need is implementation. And it's a bit like Tony Blair's mantra, and it, implementation, implementation. And when I worked on, I'll give you just two social charter cases that I worked on when I was a lawyer at Interrights. And one was against Croatia, which was to do around sexual and reproductive health teaching within, within Croatian schools. And we lost on some points, but one of the points that we won on was, was homophobic material that was clearly in school textbooks. And it was very easy for the Croatian government to, to hold their hands up and said, yes, this is wrong, it's unacceptable. There was no real political or economic cost for them not to comply with that finding by the Social Rights Committee. Contrast that with Interrights versus Greece, which was a case to do around Roma housing and evictions. And sorry to keep coming back to the Roma, but I think that's... Um, 
that for me is emblematic because the only reason we largely took it with our local partner in Greece was because there was another decision which I think was up on the the, 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 the screen by Padre, which was Roma Rights Centre v Greece, an earlier complaint, and that was not implemented. There was a complete finding of violations across the board, forced evictions, lack of adequate housing. So my part, the partner said, look, we need to get the committee seized to this again beyond the reporting mechanism. So we brought yet another case examining similar issues but different factual evidence. And in fact, the Greek government tried to get the case thrown out because they said this is basically the same case. And by the way, that we have this reporting mechanism and the committee luckily you know, said, no, 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 we are perfectly able to deal with the similar type facts again, providing this new evidence. And again, of course, we got another finding. Um, but again, has anything happened, particularly with given what's going on in Greece? No. So I think it depends on the issues, the political and economic cost, and the type of victims, I have to say, that you work with. And as I said, with the Romo, there is a huge amount we know across the EU and the Council of Europe and standards, and the same here in Ireland with the traveler community. But often you will not see implementation uh, because it is basically there are no votes in, in upholding Roma rights. In fact, there are votes. In fact, we, we, we submitted a video uh, as part of the evidence, actually with a local mayor in Athens, in the Athens suburb, uh, outside a community. He just demolished it all. He was quite proud of this fact, and he went on the local news uh, because there was votes in obviously attacking the Roma and getting them out of the community. So I think it does very much depend on the context and the political economic cost for the state in either implementing or, or not implementing the decision. And the problem, is, as Podrick said, is there is no sanction ultimately at the end of it, really, apart from, you know, potentially with the Committee of Ministers of the European Courts, we've seen the potentially fining states, and that is a sanction. But with some of the other soft law mechanisms, there isn't a sanction there, and that, and that leads to lack of compliance, unfortunately. Thank you, Neil. Um, any other further questions? We've about seven, eight minutes or so. Hi, um, my name is Pia and I work in the Human Rights Unit of the Department of Foreign Affairs. My question again relates to um, implementation and just, Ian, you mentioned the, the huge percentage of cases of the uh, Human Rights Committee, for example, that, aren't, that are never implemented. And I was wondering, considering particularly the resource constraints under which the UN is now working, whether you think, um, and Roland is also, whether there's any greater role that the UK, UPR could potentially play in pushing for greater implementation of individual cases, whether do you think that would be feasible or not? Okay, any other further questions before I allow Ian and Roland come back on that? Okay, so maybe if we want to, um, Roland, if you want to take that first, so in terms of implementation resources in the UPR. Well, I'm in, the, in the UPR, I mean, the UPR is a mechanism that can be used to um, get other mechanisms uh, work better. I mean, in the sense that through the UPI, you can get states to report better to treaty bodies, you can get states to uh, invite special rapporteurs, you can get states to um, to s ratify conventions, and you can get states to um, to to, uh, to reuse the recommendations coming from treaty bodies, so to give recommendations from treaty bodies and a second chance. Um, but we, we have only a few um, individual cases raised at the UPR. It's very rare, uh, but it happens sometimes. And uh, I think it, can, it could have happened more states. Some states are reluctant, saying it's, we've had the case of a uh, country rejected the recommendations on individual cases, saying this is not the place to do it. But other states, I mean, it was a sole um, occasion. Other states have accepted recommendations. I have not rejected recommendations on that basis. <laughs> that the UPI is not made for individual cases. So I think it should be used. And I mean, the UPI is not really much used on ESC rights, and ESC rights are definitely not, um, I mean, the vast majority of recommendations are not on ESC rights. So there's a push, I think, that should be made. It's mostly, mostly because the most active states are European countries, and they're not, they don't make ESC rights a priority. But I think this could be changed with, uh, with work coming for, I mean, starting with, uh, rec the recommending state present here in this room. Um, when Ireland makes recommendations to other countries, uh, we're trying to have a better balance between CP rights and ESC rights, and maybe raising uh, individual um, cases uh, at the UPR process. Yeah, j just, to, j just to add briefly, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the, and there will be a similar mechanism or a similar individual charge, I believe, with, with SESCA, but you know, the Human Rights Committee has this special rapporteur on follow-up and I wouldn't want to do his job because you look at the number of case docket that he has this poor, poor guy, he has this long list of cases and he says, I've 
corresponded with government X about this case, and some of them have gone on, I think, for, for nearly decades. And I think, uh, you know, that, that is part of, again, the problem, as you said, if they're not properly resourced to do follow-up, and then there's not really a lot that, in terms of sanctions that they can use at the end of it. So I think you can... You, you, I mean, we tried with a Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, with a Human Rights Committee decision uh, that was a terrible case about, um, you know, a young guy who's disappeared and then tortured and killed, and, you know, clear finding a violation uh, by the Human Rights Committee. And we decided with our local partners to take the case actually through the, through the domestic courts all the way up to the Sri Lankan Supreme Court, because we thought, well, there they are. They will recognize, you know, rule of law, compliance, compensation for the family. And actually, no, the, the Supreme Court actually turned around and said, we are the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. This body, and they got into all sorts of issues about that the president didn't even have the power to ratify the protocol. Uh, but, the, but the issue was really they didn't like having their decisions overturned by the UN and they were not going to be told by the UN what to do. So therefore you had the senior court actually basically negating that the UN had any uh, writ did not run in the country and of course the case was still not implemented. So there are real questions on follow-up and implementation. I think sometimes you can use cross, you know, for example, like the EU and the Council of Europe, I think, you know, with, with cases that are very well known, like DH, you can, again, imply that maybe through the EU system, and we're looking potentially issues around the race directive of the EU, and there's issues there about the treatment of the Roma, and you can keep raising these cases in different fora, I think, with different individuals. So you do have to be creative, and I think a lot of it does also go, though, to the building of the social movements at the level, level. and obviously, and, and I don't think we were particularly good at that when I worked in my other NGO, you know, we weren't always in touch with those big social movements on the ground that you saw, for example, the treatment action campaign that eventually did bear real fruit. Because obviously domestic court decisions are not even implemented sometimes. So what chance, therefore, for soft law, so-called soft law mechanisms to be implemented as well? I know it sounds very gloomy, but I think we just have to be realistic. That's why you've got people like Manfred Novak and others at the UN, very respected human rights experts, calling for a world court of human rights. And I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about some people are don't see, an, I don't necessarily agree, but they don't see a future for the UN treaty body system in its current form, and that eventually we need some kind of world UN human rights court. Okay, any final questions, or may I abuse my position as chair? Okay, um, I, I suppose in thanking uh, Roland, Ian, and Porek, just to kind of sum up, I suppose, some key points and maybe pose some key questions, but ending that I do pose can be discussed over tea. Um, implementation as Pia's question suggested, is key. Um, and somewhat of a gloomy assessment from Ian, but also a very realistic assessment. Um, in terms of building social movements, I do think we have to be careful. Not all groups are popular within society. We have seen, however, how the European Convention on Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union have advanced the rights of asylum seekers um, and very basic, very minimum socioeconomic rights. We've also seen how the European uh, Social Committee have, um, have at least began that discussion on the rights of those who may not be as popular or um, as sympathetic as victims as those who may be um, aged, who may be disabled, who may be young. Um, so it's important, I think, to keep in mind that while there are implementation issues at the international level, um, these mechanisms can nevertheless be used um, simply as awareness raising and also as a means to um, ensure the spotlight is kept on um, various rights violations of the state. So a big thank you again to Porik, Ian and Roland, um, and we can continue this discussion over tea. Thank you.